Hello to everyone, my name is Yerney, and with my collaborators, we found that the leafhopper males uh, somehow compensate for unclear directional cues in vibrational mediated mate localization, and I will tell you a bit more about this. Um, so, as you can probably imagine, um, a meadow can really resemble a bustling city if you're an insect, and there's a rich world of uh, vibrational emission uh, going on beneath our feet that we're mostly unaware of. And the vibroscape uh, that we'll uh, hear about tomorrow is uh, so the sum of all vibrational emissions um, uh, in, in a given environment is really complex and often quite occupied. Um, and so if we talk about plant-dwelling insects, their uh, active space is generally assumed to be the plant the animal is standing on, plus to some extent the neighboring uh, plants, so through physical contact. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> because arthropods are so abundant, uh, many competing signalers are potentially present within the active space uh, of a certain source. And to this, we should add uh, abiotic and anthropogenic noise sources. And so for, uh, for an insect, these option, options to avoid this noise are quite limited, both uh, spatially, so um, they, can, they cannot move easily to, to go to a quieter place, and uh, spectrally, they have a limiter, limited spectral range available, and to some extent, so the temporal uh, options are also quite limited. And we study these processes in Aphrodis leafhoppers, our model organisms uh, that we heard about uh, from my colleague Anka just before. And they help us to under understand mechanisms of vibrational communication and the uh, um, behavioral ecology. And uh, as was explained before, this is a complex of um, morphologically similar species. Actually, they are nearly impossible to distinguish morphologically, but um, they have quite distinct signals, so pre-mating isolation is nearly complete. And while they differ somewhat in their ecology, so their preferred hosts, uh, they nevertheless uh, often occur in the, at the same area and maybe on the same plant. And because they are so, um, they are so related, they, uh, that means they will often uh, tend to signal at the same time, uh, which adds to this um, confounding uh, issue of noise. And they, as we as we heard before, they meet, uh, they employ a typical leafhopper strategy, where the male will sing spontaneously and will uh, establish a duet uh, with the female once he's close enough. And after he perceives a duet, the male will switch to uh, searching for the female on foot. And on this, uh, uh, some uh, alternative mating tactics have emerged. So the emission of masking rival signals and the satellite male tactics where a male is able to locate the female without actually calling himself because the Males, uh, the females do not discriminate and they will mate with the first one uh, often that comes to her, even if he has not emitted a single signal. And so the, I will use the same example as before, the Aphrodis makarovi, uh, which has uh, this really complex signal uh, composed of um, several elements. And the female uh, reply, which is curious, um, will start before uh, the end of his last uh, component and will partially overlap um, his, uh, his signal and then it uh, continues for a while and the male is able to um, recognize and locate her on the host plant. <coughs> and it uh, sounds something like this.
and this is the now the female reply and it goes on for a while and what we do now and we also heard before that the um, signaling is costly so the males who are very active in signaling uh, tend to have a shorter lifespan and vice versa and it is really true that uh, th those males who live fast they die young and uh, on the basis of this, um, we established our core hypothesis that the en environmental noise in the vibrational channel is costly. And this will um, provide material basis for selection for um, so the searching tactics and the existence of um, alternative mating tactics. And we tested this uh, hypothesis with uh, first laboratory playback trials in which we measured male effort and efficiency in uh, courting and locating the female. And then we measured uh, reactive oxygen species concentration in tissues as a measure of physiological stress that would predict uh, longevity. And we also examined, again, the timbal muscle structure for further indicators of physiological stress. And we had five treatments with various kinds of um, stimuli uh, plus uh, silent control. And uh, there were, um, each male went through five trials, each, each time with the, the, with the same stimulus in two weeks. And so we, then we summed <clears throat> and we averaged all these, um, uh, all these measures. And the um, arena, for these uh, behavioral trials looked like this. There was a, <clears throat> a stinging nettle cutting with two leaves remaining. And the, animal, uh, the male was placed on top here and on, on the leaves, uh, the shakers which played uh, the stimuli were attached. So this kind of a stereo situation, one shaker played the female reply which was manually triggered and the other one played uh, the other kind of stimulus, so usually noise. Uh, so, and so um, the male was tasked to locate the, this target shaker or the ipsilateral shaker uh, as, as quickly as possible. And we monitor everything, so with a laser pointed here to the, uh, to the crossing, which was the point where the male had to make a directional decision. And we also uh, monitored it with a video camera so to show all the movements. And so these are different kinds of treatments. So first, the positive control, only the female, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, only the female reply. And then the rival treatment, which was um, one channel had female reply and the other had uh, masking rival signals, which sounded something like this. actually louder than the female reply and it masked it. And then the duet treatment in which um, we looped uh, male call and female reply and this would give the male the opportunity to switch to satellite uh, searching, uh, to satellite male tactics. And then we had the biotic noise treatment where there was a female reply plus looped call uh, of another species so this is uh, officially still a Frodes Bicincta type Dragonia. Uh, as of yet, formally not yet described species, but it has a very distinct uh, call. And so, yeah, they don't really, oops, <clears throat> they don't really recognize each other, so it's clearly a different species. And this was looped with some pause in between <clears throat> and <clears throat> Sorry. And finally, the anthropogenic noise treatment where uh, we played a uh, looped recording of a lawnmower operating nearby. Sounded something like this. So this broadband noise that was supposed to cover all the relevant frequency um, components. And uh, the results were actually quite uh, unexpected. Um, so there was a 
not very clear effect on overall efficiency. And this efficiency was a homebrew index in which we included the um, signaling effort. And uh, down here, it was uh, searching effort and efficiency. So uh, total distance covered by the mail divided by how close <clears throat> he actually came from the starting point uh, to the target shaker. And as you can see, um, yeah, there's a lot of data on this graph, but I'll try to explain. So unexpectedly, the, con uh, the positive control males, so those who received only the female reply, had actually the lowest efficiency compared with the efficiency of those who received constant looped uh, anthropogenic noise. And somehow, somewhat higher uh, efficiency was exhibited by the males who received the um, masked female reply and those who were masked by uh, biotic noise from the other species. And as predicted, at least, um, so the males who were able uh, to exhibit uh, satellite male tactics and uh, not signal themselves had the highest efficiency. Uh, actually, the highest efficiency overall was exhibited by negative control males, which were normally silent, maybe calling once in a while, but every movement they made, uh, which was not a searching movement, uh, brought them a bit closer uh, to the target shaker, uh, but this was, these were usually very short movements, so they didn't actually locate the shaker in most cases. And so, um, to understand the reason for this odd result, we looked at other behavioral parameters, and we did not find noise to have any effect on searching success, or on path efficiency, or moving latency, nor the searching time, uh, or the signal composition. So to repeat, this complex signal and some males uh, can uh, leave out one or two uh, components from the start, and we thought uh, the noise might influence that, but it doesn't really. Uh, but we did uh, find some, um, uh, we did find that uh, the males exposed to biotic noise and the duet treatment had, um, uh, so they signaled less. Uh, one interesting thing is that might unravel uh, this conundrum a bit is the path analysis. So uh, we checked th from video recordings all the movements and we saw that the uh, males varied widely uh, and this was completely unrelated to the noise playback, uh, so, the, so to the treatment. And you can see uh, males with high path efficiency. So they started here at the bottom, so this is approach zero, and they went nearly directly to the target uh, shaker, which is approach one. So the bottom of this graph is the tip of the plant that they started on, and uh, the contralateral leaf is nearly this, uh, has nearly the same distance. And then the middle of the graph is this area around the crossing where the male had to make a directional decision. And then the upper part is the ipsilateral leaf closest to the shaker. And you can see that uh, other males with lower path efficiency had a lot of problems uh, in this area in the middle, they made repeated uh, direction reversal, and um, so after wrong decisions, they they even went back on top and back down. And but when they located the correct petiole and came some way across it, uh, they located the ipsilateral leaf, and then they, they usually ran straight to the shaker. And we measured the plants to see why this happened. And um, these are the amplitudes of the female reply uh, that we played uh, from, from this side. And um, so this is expressed in decibel relative uh, to, uh, to this usual recording point uh, where the male had to make a directional decision. And it's not quite clear, but in nearly each direction away from this crossing, 
uh, the amplitude of the female uh, reply uh, was a bit higher than at the crossing point. So the males at first, we, we think that um, they detected higher amplitude and they thought that um, they were getting close to the male and only later uh, the amplitude uh, fell. And so, yeah, it's non-monotonous amplitude change uh, with approach, which might explain these uh, results a bit more. And we did find one peculiar effect of noise. Um, so the ratio of searching movement within all movement, uh, because the searching movements were very distinct, the male ran at full speed, uh, while in other cases it moved really slowly, and this was really easy uh, to distinguish on video. So we uh, analyzed these two kinds of movements uh, separately, and we found that, uh, again, it's not super clear a result. Uh, so the differences are not that significant, but you can see a slight trend. So the more the female reply was masked by any kind of noise, uh, the less uh, searching movements were there in relation to all movements. And so in, we interpret this as uh, that the male uh, tried to relocate a bit, you know, to find an area uh, with a bit um, better signal to noise ratio. Uh, so uh, based on these results, we, um, we decided we did not bother with um, comparing different treatments. We just correlated male effort with these markers of physiological stress. And so we uh, did um, transmission electron microscope uh, sectioning of uh, timbal muscles. And we found, uh, <clears throat> like was shown earlier, so that timbal muscles <clears throat> are fast muscles. They have really abundant mitochondria and extensive sarcoplasmic reticulum. And <clears throat> in normal muscles, here on the left hand side, um, the mitochondria have really dense, densely packed cristae, uh, very clearly visible. And these electron dense areas here, uh, marked by white arrows, uh, correspond to uh, intermitochondrial junctions. So there is really a lot of communication going on in the, in the cellular machinery. While in, uh, while in males, after a lot of effort, we saw that um, so the mitochondria resembled more a soup. Uh, so the, um, this clear uh, structure of crista is not apparent anymore. And, uh, so the, and also the intermitochondrial junctions uh, disappear to a large extent and we interpret this as an early marker of physiological stress. Uh, and so we also analyze the reactive oxygen species uh, concentration in tissues with standard uh, methods. But here we didn't find any correlation between signaling or searching effort and ROS in tissues found. And so to conclude, uh, to sum up, uh, we found no clear influence of noise on mate locating efficiency, uh, and except that, of course, the opportunity for satellite mate tactics does improve efficiency. And um, that the, so the alternative uh, behavioral mechanisms uh, compensate for unclear clues. Um, to put it more simply, the male simply runs across as many branches and petioles he can find, and he will, um, by chance, uh, stumble on the area where the um, female is close, and uh, uh, their response, their reply is loud. And um, at the end, effort associated effort is associated with symptoms of physiological stress in muscle cell ultrastructure, but not the ROS content, uh, which 
maybe because our method was not sensitive enough. And with this, I thank all my collaborators on this study and to you for the attention.